Um, I'm Deborah Lustig. I'm the assistant director here at ISSI. And um, I'm so pleased that you're all here today for our event. And before we start, I'd like to introduce our next event, Julia Chinieri Opara, who is a professor of ethnic studies at Mills, will give a talk titled Birth Matters, Black Women and Research Justice as Transformative Praxis. And that talk will be on Wednesday, October 26th um, from 12 to 1.30 here in this room. And I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of today's event, the Center for African Studies, uh, a few representatives here. Before we start, if you could please silence your cell phones and anything else that might make noise that you have um, with you. So today, Dr. Marsh is going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for a question and answer. It's my pleasure to introduce Robin Marsh, who joined ISSI as a senior researcher in 2014, and it's been wonderful to have her as part of our community here. She's a socio-economist with over 25 years of experience in international agriculture and rural development. And she's done work in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. She has, she has a breadth of experience. She's been a lecturer at UC Berkeley's College of Natural Resources since 2003, teaching in the field of population, environment, and development. And she's a faculty affiliate with the Blum Center for Developing Economies and the Berkeley Food Institute. She is currently P PI for the UC Berkeley UCSF Academic Partnership with a Population Health and Environmental Learning Lab in East Africa, working with Pathfinder International to develop research and training inputs for building capacity among East African stakeholders. So that's her newest project. Um, we'll, we'll be hearing about that, I think, in her next talk. Um, she received her PhD from the Food Research Institute at Stanford. The title of today's talk is Career Choices, Return Paths, and Social Contributions, Findings from the African Alumni Project. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robin Marsh. Well, it's good to see all of you, and thank you, Deborah, and the Center for Research on Social Change for inviting me. Um, this is an opportunity for me to share a little bit of the findings from our recent collaborative project, um, getting to know the career and life trajectories of African alumni of international universities. And UC Berkeley was the lead, but we had several collaborating. We had five other universities, so I just want to recognize those as uh, the PIs and the graduate students and undergraduates were instrumental in in carrying out the research. So from the US, in addition to Berkeley, is Michigan State, and from Canada, McGill, University of Toronto, and Simon Fraser, and then Earth University in Costa Rica. Um, one thing I'd like to say is, you know, this is the Center for Research on Social Change, uh, an outgrowth of this research and the realization that many scholarship programs want to understand better how scholarships can be engines for social change is that we are developing a, a book. We're writing a book at, for which I'm co-author of and you can look for it in, in 2017 called International Scholarships for Higher Education Pathways to Social Change, um, which will not be solely on Africa. It's a global it's a global um, look at scholarships. So let me go ahead. I see a couple of scholars coming in. Um, let me go ahead and tell you what we're going to look at here. Uh, I'm going to present the background and methods on the research. It was about two and a half years that we um, spent conducting this what I'd call a pioneering retrospective tracer study, and then we'll look into the findings from the four main research questions on career and life trajectories, return decisions, social and civic engagement, and something also about retrospectively uh, how did these alumni from Sub-Saharan Africa look at uh, the value of their international education. And then I'll, look, I'll take you through some of the policy implications. There are policy implications for the funder of this study, the MasterCard Foundation, and then there are also implications for our own university here. So those are the ones that I'll focus on for our audience. Um, while you look at this, I want to read you just a little bit um, about the rationale for this study. 
uh, it certainly goes outside um, my career as an agricultural economist, but I wanted to seize the day on an opportunity that came about as a result of UC Berkeley getting this large grant, the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program grant. So let me give you some background on why we conducted this study. Globally, the demand for higher education is at an all-time high, and rates of growth in this sector are very strong. A central feature of this demand is its international character. Contemporary students are more likely than ever to cross borders, seeking the credentials, technical skills, subject area expertise, and training in scientific and critical thinking available at the tertiary level. As a result, universities around the world have increasingly prioritized recruiting and supporting these international students. In spite of the well-documented individual and national benefits of tertiary education, opportunities for access remain grossly uneven around the world. Nowhere is this inequity of access more clear than in Sub-Saharan Africa, which trails all other regions in absolute and relative tertiary enrollment rates. Faced with underfunded and often underperforming universities on the continent, many top African students pursue their higher education abroad, and many do not return, the so-called brain drain. Others have returned to play leadership roles in academia, government, business, international agencies, and civil society. Nevertheless, the post-graduation evidence is largely anecdotal. The MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program has committed substantial investments, over 700 million US dollars, to improve access to quality secondary and tertiary education in Africa, as well as school to employment transition support. As part of this investment, the Scholars Program has partnered with international universities within and outside Africa to provide comprehensive undergraduate and master's level scholarships to talented economically disadvantaged sub-Saharan African youth who demonstrate leadership potential and a commitment to giving back to their communities. Yay, Lisa, I'm so glad you came. Okay, had to say that. (laughs) Because we have two alums who were interviewed for this study in the room, and I'll mention them in a second. And then we have a couple of scholars as well. Um, So yes, this study uh, was funded to contribute understanding to one of the key assumptions of the foundation's theory of change, namely that given appropriate selection processes and supports during their international education, scholars will return to their countries and communities of origin on the African continent as agents of positive social change. This is, as Martha can attest, the main theory of change of the MasterCard Foundation. So five of the grantee universities, UC Berkeley and the other ones I mentioned, um, are are grantees of the of the scholars program, and they partnered to conduct a pioneering retrospective tracer study on the career and life trajectories of past African alumni of their respective universities, with the intention to gain knowledge and insights that may improve the outcomes for current and future African scholars. So that Thelma, who is a past African alumni of UC Berkeley, might um, be able to have lessons that would be useful for Itago, who's a current scholar. We can just see this right. In fact, they did intern together, so that's kind of nice. They're sitting together. Um, so we have cert- we developed survey and interview methods um, to learn why these African alumni pursued higher education abroad how they reflect on their international university experience, what paths they pursued after graduation, and how these alumni have contributed to social transformation on the African continent. For the foundation, we were interested to examine whether the scholars program expectations of go back are realistic, or do they need to be expanded or qualified? And how could scholarship programming be improve to strengthen the factors that do encourage return and social and civic engagement, looking at the experiences and insights of past graduates from Africa. Finally, does a return remain a valid expectation in an increasingly global transnational world? 
So these were these were the big questions, and that's the background. And now I'm I, I'm just going to take you through some of our major findings. Okay. So these are our partners, and again, we developed a model. Um, based on four research questions. Just what has been the career trajectory? Believe me, there just isn't um, much evidence out there after people graduate from MSU or um, Berkeley or any of the partner universities. What happens to them afterwards is not traced. Most of the alumni offices don't keep good uh, contact with um, the international student alumni in particular. So this was actually uh, just a basic question uh, that needed to be addressed. Then, more specifically, we were interested in the return paths. What are the factors that have influenced post-graduation decisions to return or not to region and country of origin? And then on social engagement, have African alumni prioritized social and civic engagement with their country of origin? If so, in what ways and what are the factors that influence that commitment. And finally, this was not as key a research question, but we couldn't help as universities ask, well, so many years and in some cases decades past, how do you look at the value of your education here at UC Berkeley? Has it served you? Was it useful? Which components of the education? So we, we used a, a guiding three-phase model um, that one of the, the graduate students here, um, Ben Gedry Medhin, helped us to develop uh, for, for, for designing our survey and qualitative data methods. And you'll see that it, um, it looks at data from early childhood into the present. So the three phases are while in Africa, what are the influences of childhood? early mentors, uh, schooling in Africa, in many cases all the way up through the first university degree, then the university experience itself, all elements of that, and then the car career trajectory. And in the interviews, we paid particular attention to what we call critical junctures or jo choice points. Shall I do this or shall I do that? And what influenced um, particularly with a to career and social engagement. What were the factors that influenced one choice or another? And then you'll see the bars just schematically influencing this at all time are the socioeconomic and political conditions in the African context and in the global context that are uh, converging or, or, or producing push and pull factors that enter into the decisions of alumni. So next, just to let you know that the methods we, the first main occupation was simply tracing who these alumni are. This took a lot of time and I'm somewhat sympathetic to alumni offices that have, um, you know, not kept up with, um, with international alumni, particularly from Africa, because it's not centralized, it tends to be in the various departments, it's not kept up to date, um, current email information is often lacking, and so if we were going to conduct a mixed method study, first of all we had to find these people, and all of, sorry, all of the universities had some troubles with that, so we took time, we used social media, and we came up with a fairly large data set. Then we designed a um, web-based survey, which I, I would be happy to share. Anybody who's interested in doing retrospective tracer work, I think you could gain a lot from the collective experience we had in designing the survey. 181 questions, probably longer than what I would recommend if I were to do this again. And then, but it gave us a lot of insights. And um, then, as with any good mixed methods research project, we had a qualitative element of uh, in-depth interviews with a hundred of the um, alumni, many of them Berkeley, and you'll see here that the majority were conducted in person in all of these countries. We made trips, and then also with the diaspora in these various 
um, regions of uh, well, U.S. and Canada. Quick question: How many people completed the survey? That's the next okay. slide. Okay. I'm getting it. That that's a very important question. So then the survey analysis, it was somewhat challenging because we were working um, with the U.S. and Canada, and so we had to aggregate our de-identified de data uh, to protect the privacy, and we did that, and then we came up with a common code book um, for aggregating our data across the six universities. And for the interview process, we have this very, very rich data set of interviews, and because, um, you know, they were one, two, three hour interviews, the way in which we could, we made use of software packages, qualitative data packages, to help us uh, make sense of, of, of the interviews. And in the US, we decided to use Deduce, which is a web-based um, program, relatively inexpensive. And in Canada, they used Max QDA. And there's a lot more that can be done with this data too, if people are interested. We're planning to maybe publish a couple of articles based on that. So now to your question, um, Deborah. So if you want to focus, this is by partner, but the data, if you want to focus on the last column, we had about 3,500 records that we could track where we actually knew these were alumni from Sub-Saharan Africa <coughs> uh, origin. M you know, many those who moved to Canada or the United States and established themselves there before they enrolled in the university often did not come up as Sub-Saharan African because they had already made residency. So this is um, those that enrolled as nationals of Sub-Saharan Africa, about 3,500. Of those, we were able to get current contact information to then enroll in the study um, 1,575, and then we sent out invitations. Some of the some of the invitations bounced back, but we had 294 completed surveys. Incomplete surveys we weren't we didn't you know we we're, were not able to consider. And so that's about a 20 percent response rate, which is not unusual for when you're dealing with a population that has hardly had any contact with the institution since they graduated. And then 294 completed surveys, 100 interviews. So that answers your question, right? And then how about, um, before we get into the findings, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but if you're thinking what are the basic characteristics of this survey population, and if you, you, you could look at Berkeley, um, which is the second row, or you can, I can't see this well on my screen, so I'm going to have to look here or you could look at the bottom row and you'll see, for instance, with gender, 68% men, 32% women. Actually, in Berkeley, it's more men to <coughs> women. I think in, in the Canadian universities, they had better uh, gender equity and that's what brought up the means. Um, childhood, uh, this was actually important here. This is sort of a proxy for socioeconomic level, what, what percentage of the alumni came from rural backgrounds and you have almost 30%. And this was interesting because the MasterCard was worried that um, maybe this study would be picking up on more privileged, higher income um, African alumni as compared to the ones that they're hoping to attract to the current scholars program. But it is not so different. About a third came from poor backgrounds, I would say about uh, another 55-60% came from middle, and only about 10-15% were from affluent families, and those are the ones that were able to self-fund their education. And so, in, in terms of degree, I think it's important too. Only 22% were undergraduates, 37% MA, 41% PhD. So we're talking about the majority of these alumni being graduate students. Again, many of them got their first degrees in Africa. Some did undergraduates like Nisai, also in the United States. And the mean graduate year was 2003. The mean current age, 47. In terms of the current job, it was about 50-50. 50% are working um, in their country of origin. Another 5% are working in another African country. And about 45% are in the diaspora. So in terms of where, um, 
It, it turns out that MSU and Berkeley, we were able to do even a more comprehensive job of, tr of tracking down um, alumni. And so we got up to 2,200 that we were able to, just with our two universities, to get basic records and then a current res a residence uh, of half of them. So for that, you think about where are the Berkeley and MSU, two big public universities, um, African alumni, uh, where did they originate from? Um, mainly you see Eastern and uh, Southern Africa, but also Nigeria. In fact, Nigeria is the top. The top five countries, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Ghana. And this is not too different from the current scholars program as well. Not too many from Madagascar, <laughs> as Rebecca is from. So this gives you a sense of the distribution. But there are actually 35 countries represented. Um, so let me go into the findings. Um, and... Um, and then uh, the implications. So as you recall, the first, the first question is just simply on the career trajectory. And one thing we were really interested in is, have, has there been social mobility and career mobility for these alumni of international universities? And there is indeed striking socioeconomic and career mobility for our p participants compared to the majority in their countries of origin. And you see the chart on the left. The childhood socioeconomic status shows a bell curve, as I described before, in terms of low, middle, and high income origin. Um, but then today, the curve, the blue bars, is skewed to the right, and 96% of the surveyed, uh, surveyed alumni consider themselves better or much better off than the majority of their countries of origin. So education has pushed them forward. Socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomically, as one would expect, as part of the theory of change. And then to the right, how about in terms of their first jobs as compared to their current jobs? We do see that um, a, a larger number are now in positions of authority, management, director, executive founder positions, um, and that's the blue bar, and, and also you know, you'll see later on a good number, particularly PhDs, but even some of the masters have gone into academic careers. So you're finding situations where they entered, as they would in the university here, as assistant professors, and now many of our alumni are deans and chairs and even vice chancellors of universities. So continuing again on the career, what have been the career paths? The bar chart on a work sector and the pie chart on area of expertise show current employment. And again, we're looking at the survey data. You can see that a large portion of alumni are in education and research, as would be expected with the high number of PhDs represented in our study, followed by private business and nonprofit organizations. Interesting, not a lot uh, went into the public sector, which is the same situation today. The second chart below shows that alumni are fairly evenly split around six areas of expertise, health, education and agriculture, economics, public administration, and social development. It's interesting too because I think now our alumni are more skewed toward the STEM fields, but back then there was a lot of emphasis on agriculture, health, and social, science, uh, social sciences. And Thelma graduated in education. There were a number who graduated in education as well. So how about the leadership roles? Um, part of the theory of change is that with the knowledge and skills, the contacts, the networks, the, um, the confidence that people build in an international education will propel them into leadership positions. And that is what we found. We find a high percentage of alumni uh, providing leadership in strategy development, policy making, establishing ethnic ethics, publishing research, raising funds. Even 20% are involved in political lobbying, 13% in drafting laws. So we are seeing um, 
We're seeing that in some way the international education played a role in people's eagerness and, and capacity to assume leadership roles. So another important finding was around mentorship. And this was really interesting because we think of this as very important today, but it's always been important. Um, we found that mentors and international collaborations and relationships generally played a large role in alumni career trajectories. And alumni who maintained strong connections with their mentors and international institutions were able to weather career and economic hardships more successfully, particularly during volatile political periods in Africa. Here's an example of an alum from South Africa who got his degree in pavement engineering. I didn't realize that was such a big deal here at Berkeley, but apparently a lot of the technology that's just how to build very um, strong weather tolerant roads came from Berkeley and then they brought that back to South Africa and now South, A South Africa is definitely the engine for pavement engineering in, in throughout the continent and part of that start here and then that alum went back and now there's been 15 um, South African engineers who have come back to Berkeley in pavement engineering and worked with the California Transportation Service too. So this is just one example. Probably his relationship with this mentor lasted 30 years um, of what can happen if people you know, don't lose contact. And when I say about weathering uh, very difficult times, I think Thelma can attest this too, whether it's you know, during the um, Idi Amin regime or different political turmoil, economic turmoil, where honestly you could barely um, earn enough to, to, to in, any case, in any way support your families. Some of these international contacts led to research contracts, to um, collaborations that topped off their income and essentially allowed them to stay rather than emigrate. And we have a lot of cases of that. And then as things settled down, you know, um, it wasn't so much a lifeline as just, a, you know, a continuing collaboration. So then on the return paths, kind of like this diagram, um, the survey data show that African alumni careers are often nonlinear and characterized by significant mobility over time, crossing continents and employment sectors. And within this pattern of mobility, they reveal four basic post-graduation return paths. So you can see that here. The direct return, about 45%, um, returned within a year of graduation. Then we have something called delayed return, and Thelma um, in person, you know, it embodies that, which refers to those who return after 12 months with delays extending in some cases to 20 or 30 years after whole careers were worked in the diaspora or elsewhere in Africa, or some return and then left to, li in, to lead international um, careers outside and then return. This kind of back and forth we see um, for at least 5 or 10 percent. Then we have something called global, and I expect that's going to increase in, in the world that we're living in now. Um, and these are people who work in international organizations, both on the continent, perhaps in Europe or the U.S. Um, some of them actually maintain two residences, and they have companies and they, or nonprofits, um, and that's about 7%. And then the fourth path refers to those alumni who work and live in the diaspora, often in the country where they studied, sometimes in the state where they studied, primarily in North America. And some belonging to this group returned to Africa for periods of their career, came back to the diaspora, and we, they may or may not return. Um, so it's a fairly fluid situation. Um, a lot of the young people in the diaspora now, who recently graduated, are gaining uh, work experience, perhaps pursuing a, a higher degree, and they may be returning. So that 43% will shift in time. 
We found that return rates declined over time from a high of about 65% in the 1970s, um, stabling is at about 40% after 20, 2010. And you're, you, you're going to see that the undergraduates return in much lower numbers than the, the graduate students. And so that's one of the reasons. Um, as we get more undergraduates, they're more likely to stay. Um, but this is also simply the global competition for talent. I mean, there are a lot of people who, particularly if they're you know, African students in the STEM fields or in, who are social entrepreneurs and so forth, you have employers in the United States and Canada vying for that talent. So more now than ever. And then, you know, as Thelma would attest, those, you know, 60s, 70s, that, that was a time of such excitement in Africa, people were returning, and they had jobs to return to, and they were part of professional development. And um, so we'll see. We'll, we'll see. I mean, the, I think the MasterCard Foundation would like that figure to tick up. Um, so what were the factors associated with return? Because we did quite a bit of work on this, and we found um, in our descriptive statistics and some regression analysis that the main factors influencing return were the degree level, as I mentioned, um, more likely to return masters and PhDs. The idea that the PhDs would remain in the United States in academic uh, positions did not pan out um, largely in our survey, most returned. Um, field of study, Certain fields of study um, had high return rates like health, agriculture, and social sciences as compared with business, law, and engineering, more likely not to return. I think we can understand that. Um, region of origin. Uh, this is all very much having to do with social and political instability. Um, and you can see the regression analysis that alumni from West Africa had lower return rates. This was just because there were decades of instab instability, and I think Nisai can attest to this too, not a promising economic environment for people to return to for a long period. Maybe that's changing someone in some of the countries of West Africa. Scholarship type also, as if you, those with a private foundation or employer <coughs> scholarship returned in very high numbers, as compared to university scholarships, um, where they felt that they had more uh, freedom to decide what they wanted to do. And the lowest was um, self-funded, very low return rates for self-funded, maybe about 20, 25%. So these were the main factors that influenced. And um, let me, how much longer do I have? Because I might just skip ahead a little bit. 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Okay. Welcome, or could you? <laughs> so we'll get to other things, but I do. Um, I, it's interesting for you to see the dilemmas, and I remember my interview with Nisai about this. The, these dilemmas of whether to stay or whether to uh, return home after graduation. Um, when we were going through all of the interviews, these were the main um, categories of influence when people are deciding. And it's not just immediately post-graduation, it's throughout life. And it's not just those who remain in the diaspora, it's people who return home who may be questioning their decision of having returned home and whether they want to return back. And I think, Thelma, actually, you said yesterday, you said, um, you don't have to pack your bags like you're going and you'll never come home. You know, you never come back. You know, you don't have to pack, you know, a hundred suitcases because you, you, there will be opportunities to return. Um, so these are, uh, you know, some of the quotes that I think illustrate that. Say expectations. The expectations are contradictory often for alumni who are privileged to study in international universities. You have this Ugandan um, who was interviewed who says, you have the pressure from your family, your friends to stay, as in stay in the US, stay in Canada, because 
here you're getting this big fancy degree, um, things are not going that well at home. At least you know, stay a few years, maximize what you can from that degree, and um, perhaps save, make a name for yourself, and so forth. At the same time, you'll have other pressures, and this is a Kenyan who says, whether or not you got a scholarship, you have been invested to come back to do something beyond yourself. And this is something that eats away at a lot of um, alumni who, who realize they've learned a lot that could be useful back home. They did. Communities invested in them, scholarships invested in them, families invested in them, mentors invested in them, and honestly they feel that they would have more you know, more influence back home than staying in the United States or Canada. So then when they're really thinking beyond themselves, there is this expectation to return. And so these, both these things are happening at the same time. And then for career opportunities, I think this is, um, this is probably a quote from you, Nisai, if I have to say. Um, <laughs> because it says Ghanaian reciting the diaspora. Being, you know, it depends what degree you're getting and when you're graduating. So this alum says, being in the U.S., you see a lot of opportunities to do well. There is sort of a pull from the U.S., but not from back home. So it could be, you know, you would be returning to um, a very precarious economic environment at the same time, as I said, this global competition for talent here, they're offering new jobs coming from prestigious universities like Berkeley. And so this is happening to you, at least at, in certain periods of time. Um, and I remember this was a period of economic uh, downturn in Ghana. At the same time, a Ghanaian who has returned uh, writes, there's a vast amount of opportunity in Africa. If you do come back, there's this sort of open field of opportunities that you don't necessarily see while you're abroad. So things are, <coughs> from his perspective, if you have the certain kind of social and professional networks, if you have relevant degrees and so forth, that actually there may be more and more creative and interesting opportunities at home than what he or she would have back here. So these are the, just to point out the dilemmas that people are going through. I, one of the... Um, alums that we interviewed is from Togo, and he was a refugee, and uh, he had always wanted to return home, and he said, I really wanted to go back, but I gave myself 10 years, planning that during those 10 years, the government would be gone in Togo. But of course, this government in Togo lasted a very, very long time, and so now he's thinking to return, but not to Togo. He's having more the Pan-African uh, perspective and he may go back to some other country that's more welcoming. So these are the sorts of dilemmas. And then um, I won't be able to go through all of this, but we did find um, in terms of social and civic engagement a lot of very encouraging evidence of people not just pursuing careers that advance um, you know, themselves and their families, um, but that are beyond that and pursuing careers that directly relate to African social and economic development, both those that live in their country of origin and interestingly, a quite a few in the diaspora. And this was a big finding of this study actually because foundations tend to think that those that remain the diaspora, it's part of the brain drain, and it's actually somewhat of a loss to what you know their expectation is. And so we really wanted to look at and see the engagement of the alumni in the diaspora with their country of origin. Were they, had they totally severed that relationship? Or you know what was <coughs> going on? It turns out that almost a quarter of those in the diaspora are working directly on African development. So that's either with the Center for Disease Control or the World Bank or one of the big nonprofits. And so they're very much involved. And, and then in this next one, I think we can see, um, actually, I'm going to move ahead since we can see 
okay, if they're not directly involved in Africa in terms of their career, how about in terms of other kinds of contributions? And we're seeing that Africans in the diaspora are contributing remittances, investing money, almost 40%, 32% making charitable contributions. So social change outcomes are still very uh, positive for the majority of African alumni living in the diaspora as well as an even larger um, majority of those that return. You might ask the question, I think it's legitimate to say, what kinds of transform transformative change really needs to take place on the continent? It can't be um, accomplished from outside. And I think there's, you know, the alumni that we talked to said in terms of deep institution building, in terms of changing governance, impacting um, large numbers of people, being there on the ground, going through um, the hardships and um, persevering leads to certain kinds of change that is not able to take place outside. So it's not a judgment call, but you have to recognize that in terms of social activism, a lot of it has to take place on the continent. And I think Thelma can talk to us about that. Then in terms of the value of an international education, um, I find this really interesting. Um, I, you know, when asked how about your situation as compared to your peers who did not get an international education, how did you fare with respect, we asked with respect to um, three aspects, finding a first job, career advancement, and making a positive difference in the country of origin. And it's interesting that um, the mean here where it's much worse off is one, much better off is five, we have a mean in the fours there. So people did feel over time that it gave them a real leg up in all three categories, having the international education. And then we ask kind of what, you know, what aspects of the education are they, you know, still using, maybe sometimes um, decades later. And one of it is simply the university prestige and reputation has helped them in their career mobility. The other, I thought it was interesting, the academic courses and the research is still very, um, important in the work that they do and even beyond the academic sector. So the young students here, you know, are still the critical thinking skills, some of the intercultural um, uh, competency, the, um, you know, the actual academic content, the, the research skills people um, use throughout their lives. I thought that was interesting. And so critical thinking was Again, it's something that the U.S. and Canadian universities are known for. This was not, you know, prompted, but it came up again and again that um, this kind of ability to express themselves, to have their opinions, res you know, respected, um, to get a bigger picture, um, were areas that they particularly remember, that the practical side of the education here, I mean Thelma is here right now trying to learn a little bit how to um, instill some of our hands-on practical experiential learning that we value in some areas of our education back to more traditional universities in Africa. That, And then, um, I'll just go, the challenges were still there. Um, academic, social, financial, it's not that people did not face challenges. In the cases of the alumni that we interviewed, everybody was somehow able to overcome these with advising and everybody got their degree. Now, there may have been some that didn't get their degree and then they didn't figure into the study. Um, one thing that came out of our study that actually has been picked up by the foundation is that the graduate students experience far fewer challenges generally than the undergraduates. And, you know, it's largely the maturity that they had to deal with social issues such as racism and homesickness and a more advanced capacity to focus and overcome academic challenges as compared to 
young undergraduates. And remember, the MasterCard has focused on undergraduates, and now they are switching. They have switched to focus on undergraduate education in Africa, graduate education internationally. Primarily master's degree focused on fields that for which there is um, a demand back home. And so they're targeting, you know, they, they, they didn't really know exactly what they were doing initially, and now they're beginning to tailor to, um, to strengthen African universities back home, infuse some of the important advantages that we have internationally into those universities, and then for the international exposure and some of the high-level uh, coursework, come here for a graduate degree. That's where they're focused now. So, just a couple minutes. One thing, um, you know, we talk about networking as being so important. Um, in, we found in our study, come on in, better late than never. <laughs> um, So we found in our study, you know, that actually the networks have been working, you know, very well for a very long time. That some of the people who studied here in the in the seventies and eighties and nineties, they maintained, they formed relationships with faculty here who were very interested in Africa. Remember, it was um, your professor who actually met you in Uganda, and this has happened. If, if the students know to knock on the doors of the faculty members or to tap into faculty, students, and other advisors on campus who have a particular interest in Africa, and they are that, ac that expert on the ground when they return home. These kinds of networks work extremely well over, over a lifetime. And so I think we have an obligation to really help and this is just, I'm talking about African students, but I would say this for all the international students, to really build those networks and to not um, expect that every student has the capacity, the inclination to knock on those doors. So we, we, we need to facilitate that. Um, and uh, interesting, they were, they were, when the MasterCard started this out, they thought, well, maybe some of the students coming to Berkeley, for instance, would be at a disadvantage when they return home because they will have neglected their networks back home. Everybody will be very, very well connected who study in the country of origin, but here you are 8,000 miles away. Um, well, it turns out that that was true for about half of the students. Half of the students did get kind of disconnected and began to link with um, diaspora populations here and lost. But about half even strengthened their, um, their social and professional networks in Africa while they were staying abroad. And all I can think is now with the digital social media that that's even happening more. So there's now African students here can be building their international networks, their, so, their social, their, you know, social entrepreneurship, the Silicon Valley, the whatever, taking advantage of the full panoply of what Berkeley offers and still keep in touch very much with their networks back home. I mean, that's an advantage that we have now. And finally, for advice for scholars, um, this was just a little add-on, but we said, you know, we have all these we have all these African scholars now at UC Berkeley, Michigan, uh, um, MSU, and, and in case you didn't know, this has been a huge, a huge game changer for Berkeley because, as you saw, we don't we we used to have about ten African students a year, very few. Now suddenly we have like a hundred African students on campus. It's not going to last for very long, um, but we we thought. Could the predecessors, could the alumni provide some interesting advice for these youngsters? And this is what they came up with. Um, the top thing was to choose a course of study relevant to the growth fields in Africa. Um, and that could be quite broad, but you know, when people choose their degrees, when they choose their graduate degrees, they should be very aware 
of the job, you know, what is the job sector going to look like when they return home? That was the number one. And then maintain and expand your, your networks in your country of origin. I think some of the alumni are worried about the brain drain and they are saying, you know, resist the pivot toward the country of study, um, you know, or at least the complete pivot by maintaining your, your, your networks back home. And um, as well as building the international network. So these came up, keep up with current affairs in Africa. And then return as often as possible. Um, use, I think the return as often as possible, sure, that would be great, but you know, that depends on people's resources and everything. Uh, so this was the advice. And then um, I'm not going to do that. I, I just wanted to end with this one slide because <coughs> this one already, the MasterCard is um, adopting a lot of the policy recommendations, recommendations of this study, and I think that's great. And they were going in that direction anyway. But how about for the how about for UC and for University of Michigan State and our partner universities? What did we learn? And I'd just like to almost end on this comment that we like to think of ourselves as a global university. Remember um, um, Nick Dirks, you know, talked a lot, you know, that he'd like his legacy to be that he helped this university to be even more global, more international, and have a, a, a wide global reach and impact. And yet, we don't systematically follow the impact that we're having through our alumni. And just through this study, it is quite amazing. I mean, the Prime Minister of Uganda is a Cal alum. The head of the African Center for Economic Transformation in Accra is a Cal alum. The head of Mulago Hospital um, and the dean of, of, of the medical school in Makerere University is a Cal alum. The head of SLUM and um, and Shack Dwellers International is a Cal alum, and on and on. And do d does does Berkeley say? And, and let me tell you, they're not shy about saying Berkeley had something to do with what I decided to do in life, and Berkeley has something to do with you know the values that I bring to my work. Um, there's so many stories. And, and it's not just anecdotal. I thought, okay, you know, there are the stars, the Patrick Awua, head of Ashesi University and so forth, but it's why we have so many African alumni who've worked on HIV AIDS since the beginning. I mean, since there was 100% mortality. It was a graveyard. And we've had so many Cal alum who have been there at the start, Ivory Coast, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, we don't tell that story. We'll talk about impact. I, I feel kind of passionate about it, as you can tell, um, <laughs> because we need to do that. The alum have, you know, we need to tell that story, and then um, we need to say, we're not just interested in you for your money, because, of course, that is the traditional way in which we uh, engage our alumni. We want to see other ways in which you can give back. We want to see, can you give back by mentoring our, our students? Can you give back by um, um, it joining in academic exchanges, in um, hosting students for internships, in um, having alumni uh, series, um, speaker series, and um, in just helping us to understand the impact that you're having and what role Berkeley played in it. So. I'm hoping, and all of the six universities feel the same way, MSU is doing a very good job. I would say MSU is doing the best job. They are really looking at their alumni carefully. Um, and so that's, that. and then the final conclusion is I'm going to be talking with folks here at UC about saying, how about um, developing a more systematic way of tracing our international alumni, just generally, not just Sub-Saharan Africa, all populations of international alumni. Let's really use the methods that we developed here, apply it across the board, and um, yeah, have a whole unit on this. And so I'll be, be hoping that happens. Oh, and this is the last, last, last. 
I got uh, we this so this guy Ruhakan Abdurgunda. He's the prime minister of Uganda now, and and come you know you may not be all that enthusiastic about the present government of Uganda, but this guy um, he got his degree in maternal and child health. He was a refugee from Idi Amin, and when I sent my you know I, I just as every researcher should do sent the report to all the people who participate in the study, and he did grant an interview. He sent this note back. We remain fully at your disposal as you further consolidate and advance this important research work, which has filled a wide vo void of knowledge, especially on UC alumni from Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's kind of an invitation for us to, you know, see what comes next for this work. And I'll end with that. Thank you.